Good evening, older audiences. How are you doing? I'm gonna cover up, get my weighted blanket over here. Shout out to my friend Jasmine, who lent me this weighted blanket and then it just became my weighted blanket. We really appreciate her. <laughs> so we're on the next to last segment of Everworld Search for Cinna. So we're going to read chapters 29 and 30 tonight. Then on Tuesday morning at 11, we're going to read 31 and 32, and we'll be at the end of this book. Never fear. There are 11 more books in this series. <laughs> so... We will be having quite the journey with our young heroes and um, all the playlists are on YouTube so you can go and just listen to them straight through. <sighs> so let's get this going. Where did we leave off? Let's see, what was it? Oh, yes, okay, so they had just had their meeting in the real world while they were asleep in Everworld, and now they've just woken up back in Everworld. So, Sven Sword Eater was there by the rail. I wasn't sure if I was allowed to be around him or not, but mostly the Vikings seemed like a fairly democratic bunch, as long as you didn't screw up. Then this wiry little guy named Jospin would come over and kick the hell out of you. I got up, moving carefully so as not to wake Christopher or Jaleel. They would still be back there, sitting on the grass, nibbling Doritos and asking themselves how they could stay there. I'd still be there too. Part of me. That me. But they'd know that I'd crossed back over, that I was in Everworld again. I went and stood, leaning on the rail and looked up at the stars. Different stars. I was pretty sure. No North Star. A moon, but larger and more pale. Sven was doing pretty much the same. Hanging and looking and, I guess, thinking. When he spoke, it was with a heavy speech impediment. Like he had a mouthful of sandwich. I was surprised he could talk at all. I could see the scars even in the starlight. My father says... You escaped from Loki's castle. No point denying it. Yeah, the four of us, I said. Long silence. My father says you come from the old world. The world of before. I sucked in a deep breath. Yes, we, um... Excuse me for not knowing, but do you have some title I should use when I talk to you? Sven smiled his hideous smile. No. Harold is lord on this ship, and he fall when Sancho will take his place. I'm only Sven. Tell me about the old world. It's very different, I said. More like, I don't know, more complicated maybe? Lots of machines. Flying machines and cars. It's hard to describe. It's mostly peaceful, at least where I'm from. No swords or armor. We have guns instead, and, you know, TVs, movies, books. Well, David, I thought ruefully, that should paint a pretty clear picture. It's very different, I added lamely. Tell me about this place, Everworld. It's very different, Sven said without missing a beat. We both laughed. Silence again. Things are changing, Sven said after a while. Many things. For many centuries, we tended our fields and planted and harvest and cheered our sheep and bred our cows and horses. Twice a year, we would go a Viking. We raided along the coasts of Atlantis until they agreed to pay us the yearly tribute. And then we raided up the great Nihilus River to take the gold and silver in the Egyptians. 
and through the swamps and hens to find the wonders still made by the cool hatch. We took slaves and women and all manner of riches. And of course we trade peacefully when that was profitable. Our fish and wool for dwarvish swords and wood for Greek pottery. Sounds interesting, I prompted, while my brain was busy going. Atlantis? Coup hatch? I glanced over, wishing Jaleel or Christopher would wake up so they could hear some of this. There is a balance in this world, Sven, Sven said. And then came the headlong. I saw one of them, I said. It came out without me thinking about it. A sudden blurt. All at once, the friendly chat was over. Sven spun, grabbed my arms, and yanked me close. You all have one. Where? Where? In Loki's castle, I said. Finally gone. Sven whispered appalled. By the gods of Asgard, father, father. Sven and I were no longer friends. He dragged me, half stumbling toward the stern, yelling, cursing, calling for his father to wake up. Seconds later, I was standing in front of Harold Goldtooth, Sancho, Sven, and half the ship. You're sure you saw a head to one, Harold commanded. Yes, yes, my lord. Neither man or dwarf or nymph or elf or any other creature of the old world, but not like the Kuhach or the Et either, but standing as a man stands with wings and with with three little insect-like arms that are always moving, like they're snatching food out of the air, I finished. Loki called him a hedwan. I think he was, like, a representative of some guy named Ka Anur. Not a sound from any of the men and women there. I swear that hearts stopped beating. The water gurgled down the side of the ship, the sail sighed as it swelled, but not a word. We have been betrayed, a man said, quickly hushed. What did Loki say to this Hetwan fifth? Harold commanded. He, well, he basically was apologizing and threatening. The Hetwan was mad because I didn't know how to go on. Should I mention Sinna? Jaleel made the decision for me. Loki tried to remove someone from our world and bring her here. He sent Fenrir. He succeeded in grabbing this person, but somehow she got away from him or he lost her. That's how we ended up here. We were carried along in her wake. Harold looked to both his sons and then at each of us. I tell you now, minstrel, that if you lie to me, I will kill you. Said quietly, said without anger said with absolute seriousness. I believed him. Who is this person that Loki took from your world? I pressed my lips together firm. Not this time. I wasn't giving Senna up. We didn't have to answer. You don't lie if you don't answer. Christopher didn't feel the same. Who is she? Good question. Loki kept calling her a witch. No one laughed. No one rolled their eyes. These men took that word very seriously. What did Loki want with this witch? Harold asked. We don't know, I said. Harold's sword was out and pressed against my throat before I could twitch. I felt cold steel, a coldness that reached down deep and froze my inside. He's telling the truth, Jaleel yelled desperately. He's telling the truth. He doesn't know, not really. Harold looked hard at me. Then what does he suspect? We think Loki may want to use her somehow, April answered for me. We, we don't know how. You have to understand, we had no idea Everworld even existed. This is all new. All of it. In our world, there are no Vikings and no Loki. Harold was not offended or surprised. Of course not. When Everworld was born, the gods left the old world and came to this place, and they carried their people with them, Zeus and his children, Huit Zil Apokatili, and his foul brood, Odin, and his own, all the gods. New universe, Jaleel said under his breath. 
Then, why did the gods create Everworld? Why did they come here? Someone standing behind Jaleel swatted him in the back of the head. It wasn't malicious, but it wasn't gentle either. Harold asks the questions here, a man's gruff voice admonished. Plural. It hadn't occurred to me that he might feel responsible for us. And if we offend him, he might suffer. Harold shook his head, considering, suspicious, but not quite ready to call us liars or spies. Everyone back to your duties, he said at last, dismissing us. Grumbling, Vikings went back to sleep. April looked like she wanted to hang out with us, but it wouldn't do for us to look like we were conspiring. I went back and lay down again, but I didn't sleep. The sun rose on a Viking fleet spread across miles of ocean. We were sailing east into the sun, assuming that the sun rose in the east here, assuming it mattered. Christopher was in line to use the head. This amounted to a short platform with a hole in it. The platform hung out over sea. I used it the night before. It was a good idea to hurry. The sea had a tendency to rise up and come shooting like a fire hose up through the hole, which woke you up in a big hurry. There was no privacy, male or female, which took a little getting used to and explained my own preference for going at night. Breakfast was salted fish and had been steeped in fresh water to leach out some, but not nearly all of the salt. There was bread, still fresh after only one day out of port, and apples, small and wormy. I saw Jaleel writing in the notebook from April's backpack. I went over to stand by him, not wanting to pry. He saw me and held the pad so I could see. He was using an unlined divider piece to sketch a map. It showed the outlines of the inlet containing Loki's castle and the village. The detail was surprisingly good. Might as well get to know the place, Jaleel said. He had also covered at least one page with tiny handwriting, a description of what we'd seen so far, what we'd learned. You writing a book? I asked. More or less. A record. We don't know how long we'll be here. How long till we find a way to escape. Maybe we'll learn something and don't know its significance till later. Maybe there are clues. He shrugged. I turned toward the bow and caught a shot of fine, cold spray. It made me grin. You hate all of this so much, I asked him. Hate it? No. I think it's the most amazing thing that's ever happened to me. But that's not the point, is it? I have a life. I have a family. Friends, although they can get along without me. They aren't getting along without you, I pointed out. You're there. You're there and here. Yeah, that's too strange, he said. Anyway, that's my life, man. Back there. Back in my own universe. That's my life. Yeah. Good life, I said sarcastically. You work where? Burger King? Boston Market. We'll both go off to college, get degrees in something or other. Business major, minor in journalism, Jaleel said. Whatever. So you do what with the rest of your life? He didn't look like I was getting to him. Report on business, you know, Wall Street Journal, CNN, CNBC, something like that. Get married, have kids, buy a nice car, buy a house, water the lawn, shop with your wife, watch TV. You ever think about that? Going to work every day, kissing someone's butt? Someone's, it doesn't matter who, some boss you'll have to tell, yes sir, brilliant idea, sir. Maybe I'm the boss, he said with a small smile. Maybe you are. So it's someone else is kissing your butt. Is that better? I mean, high school is four years and it seems like forever. You work for 30, 40 years, 40 freaking years getting in the car, driving through traffic, dealing with BS, driving home, and taking the kids to buy sneakers. I realized April had come over. How long she'd been listening, I don't know. And you don't want all that? She asked me. Maybe someday, I said. I don't even know if I'll go to college. But my mom's looking at an MBA for me. And I go along mostly. Why? Because I care about business? 
No, because everyone's on me about my future. You gotta get the grades so you can get a good college, so you can get a good business school, so you can get on with some big firm where you shuffle papers and tap on a keyboard. And that's it. Man, that's your life till you get old and wonder what the hell you did with your life. That's not life. Not for a man, anyway. April cocked an eyebrow. The way you describe it, it doesn't sound like a life for anyone. That won't be my life. You leave out all the good stuff. Friends and family, kids, the things you love to do. I waved my hand, dismissing it all. There used to be adventure, you know, going west in a wagon train or going to war or exploring someplace no human had ever been before. Now what do we have? Look at Sven. Look at that guy. He's my age. Look at his life. Then look at mine or Jaleel's or yours. April barked out a laugh. He can barely talk because someone rammed a sword through his mouth. I nodded. You know the difference between him and me? We're both about 16. He's a man and I'm a boy. April made a face. Angry, dismissive, frustrated. What is it with you guys? Is it the testosterone? You know, David, it's the dawn of the 21st century and you live in the richest, most powerful nation on earth where there's almost no one starving and no one enslaved and no one invading to murder and pillage and rape. And finally, finally, after thousands of years of men slaughtering men, women, and children over nonsense, we have a few places on earth where there's a little peace and a little decency. A few places where most people get to be born and live their lives without total horror being rained down on them. And your reaction is, this has to stop. Christopher had wandered over. Drawn by the sound of harsh words, I guess. He laughed. Don't blame me, April. I'm a lover, not a fighter. Would you like a demonstration? April and I stood glaring, both angry. Not angry at each other, not really, but glaring at each other because neither of us could find any real enemy to take our frustrations on. Come on. Peace, Jaleel said. As bizarre as it sounds, we're on our way to a war between Vikings and Aztecs. Probably not much point in having a little battle of the hormones between you two. April and I backed away. But it was a phony piece. We were making it making nice for Jaleel and Christopher, and because we looked like idiots in front of the men. The breeze had gone back, had gone slack, and Harold reluctantly ordered the men to their oars. I went to my bench and rowed and wondered how much I believed what I said. I noticed Christopher taking a bench toward the bow, the bow. One of the crew had smashed his hand up the day before and Christopher took his place. He fouled the oars a few times till he got the rhythm. Harold called for a song and April obliged. She sang Blue Skies. I think she faked about half the words, but the Vikings thought it, Vikings thought it was great. Other boats rowed closer, keeping station with ours. The calm didn't last long couple hours and then we got more wind and the land lovers than the land lovers wanted and it was a sailor's breeze the big square sail bellied out and the bow slicing the waves sending up explosions of spray the wind held through the night i fought sleep but sleep came anyway and i crossed over into pe in the middle of a scratch basketball game i wanted to quit the game but i couldn't because you don't just quit even though no one cares but the one jerk who wants to prove he's somehow a hardcore jock. I went through PE in my last two periods and made it home where my mom had made veggie lasagna for dinner. And we watched some sitcom and she laughed and told me I should laugh too. So I did. None of it mattered. Had it ever mattered? If it ever had, it didn't anymore. I was far away from it. Real seemed unreal. Familiar was strange. I'd gone to sleep in living color and woke into black and white and all the shades of gray. This wasn't it for me, not anymore. My world wasn't about condescending teachers and hypocrite parents and why don't you take out the trash and where's that 2,000 word paper, Mr. Levin? I'd lived 16 years worth of shiny malls and dark school hallways and narrow homes and TV 
blaring and smiley face email and don't do drugs, don't do sex, don't smoke, don't eat junk food, don't, 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 because you're boring, boring life. Your robot march from kindergarten to grammar school to junior high to high school to college to work to the condo in Florida to the grave where you'll slowly decay for all eternity should be nothing but leafy green vegetables and happy thoughts and G-rated lyrics about puppy love. I knew where I was. I was aboard a Viking ship on my way to battle. I wasn't here. I wasn't in my chair in my living room watching two-dimensional images of people pretending to be other people. I was asleep. And this was all a memory. I hooked up with Christopher later that night and we talked about school and some girl and some team and some game that neither, neither of us cared about. We went our separate ways. Unable to figure out how to relate the now strange universe where we live our entire lives. We went for a walk over to the Big border store. I decided if I was going to sail the seas of Everworld, I'd see if I could not make some improvements. I'd look up a book on the history of sailing, trying to figure out what I could do to enhance the sailing characteristics of a Viking longboat. She was in the coffee shop sitting at a table. I saw her in the world, the brightly lit world swirled around me. Cinna, sipping tea from a paper cup. That's it for tonight. And on Tuesday, the final two chapters of Everworld Search for Cinna. Oh my gosh, I'm so hyped. I can't wait until Tuesday. I'll see you all at 11 on Tuesday.